Welcome back to the Gentleman's Gazette and to our complete guide about ironing. In this four-part series, we'll teach you how to iron a dress shirt, how to iron slacks, chinos, or pants, as well as suit jackets or sport coats. Before we can do that, we need to make sure you have all the ironing tools you need. And because of that, part one is dedicated to ironing essentials. We'll discuss everything that you need and all those things that you can skip. So first of all, why should you learn how to iron? It's always a skill that can come in very handy if you're in a place where no one else can do it for you. A nicely ironed shirt, a beautifully ironed lapel, or the crisp grease on a pair of pants is something that really can highlight the make and the quality of your garments. At the same time, if your clothes aren't ironed properly, they will wear out prematurely and they won't look the part. So why shouldn't you just bring your shirts and suits to the local dry cleaner? Most of the time, they were machines and don't really take care of your garments properly. That way, your shirt colors wear out very quickly and the creases are just off. Sometimes you get your suit jackets back with the lapel areas ironed flat and maybe you end up with a crease in your sleeve that you never wanted. If you're lucky enough to find a hand ironing service, chances are the prices will be much higher than your machine ironing. Also think about the money you put into your wardrobe. You don't just wanna throw your investment away and keep items that last you as long as possible. Even if money is of no concern to you, I still urge you to learn how to iron properly and then maybe hire someone who you can teach so you get a much superior result from your own home that is really better than anything else you can find from an ironing service. Before you can learn how to iron the proper way, you need the right equipment. In my opinion, the first and most important thing you need for ironing is a proper ironing board. By that, I mean nothing flimsy, but a really solid stand that won't just tip over. I urge you to skip the 10 and $20 ironing boards because they can't be adjusted to the right height, they're flimsy, and over time they will break down much more easily. An ironing board should also be long enough to fit the length of your entire slacks or pants, and most cheaper boards are very short. You definitely want a freestanding model that's about 18 inches wide and at least 48 inches long. They usually cost anywhere between $40 and $100, depending on the quality level you choose. Some come with features such as an iron rest, which is quite handy, or a cable feed, which is also quite advantageous because it prevents the cable from pulling and wrinkling your shirts or your other garments while you iron them. You also want a nice padded cover for the perforated metal surface because that way the steam from your iron can go through and you get actually a better result in a shorter amount of time. Definitely check the surface of the ironing board so you can't feel the surface underneath. Otherwise, you may end up seeing the pattern of the metal surface when you iron your shirt, and that's the last thing you'd want. I've used standard freestanding ironing boards for years, but I always wondered why professional tailors would get a much smoother result in a much shorter time. I found out the number one reason was that they used professional grade vacuum boards. If you want a decent ironing job, you need to have a steam iron. On a regular freestanding board, that steam will accumulate and sometimes get wet. Therefore, it slows down the ironing time and the result is not as smooth, but sometimes rippled. With a professional ironing board, you get a vacuum engine that sucks the air through the ironing board, thus helping you to iron very quickly without any ripples. Cost-wise, they start at five to $600 and go all the way up to several thousand dollars. In my experience, the lower end models are perfectly sufficient for in-home use. I've had my ironing board since 2010 and it's still in fantastic shape. It cost me about $400 back then. I think today a comparable model will run about $600. Honestly, vacuum boards are the single biggest secret when it comes to get a professionally looking ironing result. Personally, I take a vacuum board that costs $500 paired with a $10 or $20 iron any day over a really expensive $1,000 iron with a quality freestanding non-vacuum board. The second item you have to invest in is, of course, the iron. While professional-grade irons usually have a gravity feed and are always quite expensive, you can find irons starting at $5 all the way up to $500 or $1,000, even for the personal sector. Now, obviously, the lower-end models have fewer options, but here's what you need. The most important thing is that your iron has steam heat. The more steam, the more powerful the steam, the better your iron is going to be. You also want an iron with a really smooth underside that is either ceramic coated or has something else that makes it really smooth and easy to iron for you. Sometimes ironing is also referred to as pressing and that's because of the weight. Heavier irons are better than lighter weight irons. Why? Because it does the work for you and you don't have to push manually. You definitely want your iron to have a nice tip 
Traditionally, you have just one tip. Sometimes you'll also find them with two tips, which come in quite handy when you iron shirts a lot and you want to get good results going back and forth without creating any extra wrinkles. If you have a vacuum board, you can't have enough steam holes and enough steam pressure because the more steam you'll have, the better the result will be. Personally, I have a professional grade Japanese Hashima iron, which I use for pants and suit jackets, but for my dress shirts, I use a regular $40 Panasonic iron. The third thing you'll need is distilled water, at least if you live in most places of the world and if you don't have a water softening system. If you use regular tap water in your iron, you'll get a mineral buildup. The mineral buildup inside the iron will not only shorten its lifespan, but more importantly, you'll end up with whitish, grayish, or brownish minerals that come through the steam holes and stay on your shirt and may stain them, then you have to wash them again, and it's a huge pain in the butt. Sometimes you also want to spray your garments with water. Most irons come with a built-in spray head. The problem is they work very poorly and you'll end up with a very moist spot in the middle, but you want something that's distributed. And so I suggest to buy a misty spray bottle so you get a fine mist that is evenly distributed across your garment. Now maybe you live in a place like I do where the water is very soft and there's very little mineral buildup. And in that case, I could just use tap water without having to worry about any of this. Four, invest in a pressing cloth. If you have a regular iron, it gets quite hot, especially on a steam setting, and you wanna protect your wool garments because otherwise they get quite shiny. So you lay the cloth in between the iron and the garment you want to iron. I suggest you get with 100% linen or cotton cloth that is lint-free. You can even use an old shirt because they're very thin and they protect the wool garment from the hot iron underside. Alternatively, you can invest in a professional solution, which is a Teflon sole that you simply hook on to your iron. In my opinion, it's totally worth the 10 to $20 it costs because it's really smooth and it protects your garment much better from the heat. At the same time, your iron can produce all the steam it wants and the garment will be pressed neatly. Again, either the cloth or a Teflon sole work best with a vacuum board. Next item is not a necessity, but a convenient add-on, the so-called sleeve board. It looks like a separate ironing board and it comes in very handy when you iron sleeves so you don't get the crease. It's called sleeve board because it was designed for shirt and jacket sleeves, but you can also use it on smaller areas such as the waistband, maybe your pant leg, or anything else that requires intricacy. My sleeve board has a wider and a slimmer side, so I can use it for a range of things. You can find the link to the one I'm using on the website here. The sixth item is a presser's or a tailor's ham. It's not a necessity, and it's some kind of a cushion that looks a bit like a ham, but it has rounded edges, and because of that, it's very easy to iron the jacket shoulders or the chest or anything where you have round pieces, because after all, when you iron on a flat board, you don't get the same results as if you iron them on the round. The version I use costs about $12 on Amazon, but you can also invest in really expensive tailor grade ones for several hundred dollars. The seventh item is a so-called tailor clapper or point press. It's simply a wooden block with smooth edges that has some weight. It's meant to help you get really crisp creases. So once you iron a crease, you add the wood right afterwards, push on it, and the crease result will be much better than if you just use your iron. Strictly speaking, a tailor's clapper is not necessary, but every professional I've met swears by it because the creases are just sublime. They cost about $20, but if you're into woodworking, you can use any kind of oak wood that is about 12 inches or 30 centimeters long, about three inches or seven to eight centimeters wide. The eighth thing you might want to consider is a steam press. It's an item that you can really only use for one application, which is getting the crease into your pants and nothing else. They usually cost $200, they're very really boxy and big, so I suggest you rather take that cash and invest it into a quality vacuum board and you'll get much better results and you'll thank me for it. The ninth item you wanna invest in is a close steamer because usually it produces a lot more steam than your iron and it can be used especially on jackets after you wear them or on pants to get out the wrinkles and refreshen them. Now, I have one and I use it regularly if you don't have the space, maybe just get an iron because usually they also have a steam function. And again, take the money you saved and invest it into a vacuum board. The 10th item you may want to consider is a linen spray. It adds a deodorizing effect to shirts. And when you use it, spray it on the inside of the shirt when you iron from the outside so you avoid any possibilities of staining. If you like starchy shirts, the spray starch you find at the grocery store won't do much for you. 
Traditionally, starch churros would be all emerged in a starchy solution and you have to make it out of rice starch. We won't go into that because it's very complicated and it would be just subject of its own video. Last but not least, I suggest you always have a large plastic bag handy. It can be a garbage bag because that way you can add dry shirts in there, add a little bit of water, ideally with a fine misty sprayer head. If you don't have that, just add regular water, close it down, let it sit for half an hour, and that way your garments get moist all over and ironing becomes much more easy. Of course, you achieve the best results with just a slightly damp shirt, but we'll talk more about it in part two about how to iron the dress shirt. So stay tuned. In today's video, I'm wearing a variation on a double-breasted stroller without a waistcoat. I'm using a double-breasted gray flannel jacket, which is really dark gray, and that's why I can wear it without a vest. It's part of a gray flannel suit, but for my pants, I use a black and white pair of houndstooth pants with cuffs. A traditional stroller would not have cuffs because it's a more formal garment, but in this case, I like the look. I'm wearing it with a white double cuffed dress shirt with cufflinks from Fort Belvedere, which are carnelian red and sterling silver, which goes well with my carnelian red and sterling silver ring, as well as my red bow tie from Fort Belvedere. Because I'm wearing a Fort Belvedere silk rose boutonniere, I'm simply going with a plain white pocket square with hand rolled edges and a TV fold. The socks I'm wearing are gray with clocks and the shoes are black double monks, which are tied together by the socks and they go well with the jacket for an overall rather formal outfit. With this outfit, I could easily show up to a board meeting, to a formal office meeting, or to any kind of cocktail party and be always appropriately dressed. At the same time, because of the combination, it's not as stiff and formal as a three-piece dark business suit. <laughs> Thank you.